Good morning, Bright City. I am Abby Crick. I work on the staff here at Bright City as the Director of Community Ministry. And at Bright City, we exist to help you take your next step toward Christ. Our ultimate hope is that we would see people restored to God, restored to others, and restored to themselves. So we're so glad that you are here with us. If it is your first time, your next step is just to let us know that you are here by scanning the QR code and filling out the connection card. Later this week, I will follow up with you and help you get more connected with Bright City. Another thing you can do is meet with our pastors, Ike and Sharon, after the service in the lobby. On your way out, you'll see this big white banner that says new here, and they'll be in that area. Um, so I encourage you to stop by if you have any questions. There's also a gift there for you to pick up if you would like. Um, one of the ways that you can also participate in the life of Bright City is through giving. At Bright City, we talk about this being an act of worship. It's how we can tangibly demonstrate the priority of God in our lives. So if that is the next step that you want to take, once again, you can scan this QR code and click give, or you can go to brightcitychurch.com giving, and you can set up reoccurring monthly giving. Another way that you can participate in the life of Bright City is through serving. In 1 Corinthians 12, we see this passage that describes a beautiful image about the church being similar to the body of Christ or being referred to as the body of Christ. And so essentially there are all these different parts that together fulfill one purpose. So if you are looking for your part at Bright City, Go to the QR code, find the serve form, and see the list of serving opportunities that we have. There are all kinds of teams. You can see info about them and see which one you might be interested in joining. But there are also a, a few specific needs that we have that I want to mention, and it is with the worship team. And so we are looking for a few experienced drummers and a few experienced guitarists and a few male vocalists. So if you are in any of those categories, we highly encourage you to go to the QR code and fill out that form. Um, so we also have a few upcoming events that we just want to share with you as this is Holy Week leading up to Easter next Sunday. So we will kick off our events at Bright City on Friday with Good Friday when we will celebrate and remember the death and crucifixion of Jesus. So we will have an online service and in the lobby there's a little basket on a table that you can pick up this little bag which has three candles that you will use throughout the duration of this online service. There's also a card with a QR code on it so you can find the link to the service there or you can find the link in the newsletters. The next morning, we'll have our next event, which will be an Easter egg hunt at Piney Woods Park. We'll be there at 10 a.m. There will be an Easter egg hunt. There will be cookie decorating, and there will also be donuts. So we invite you to come. We would love to see you there. And then next Sunday is Easter Sunday, the day we've been waiting for leading up from Lent. Um, next Sunday, we will have re refreshments in the lobby, but I also want to encourage you to invite a friend. Maybe it's a coworker, a neighbor, a family member. We will be talking about the gospel message once again, and maybe someone needs to hear it for the first time or the 50th time, wherever they may be. I would encourage you to take that courageous step this week and invite them to come with you. And like I said, there will be refreshments, so maybe that can be like your shameless plug to bring them. Um, and then next Wednesday at Pray First, we are going to do baptism. So if you or perhaps your child is interested in getting baptized, then again, you can go to this QR code, fill out the form, and then someone will follow up with you to just further explain this next step that you might want to be taking. So those are all of our announcements. So I'm going to hand it over to Erica for the reading of scripture. Good morning, Bright City. As Abby said, my name is Erica. We're going to read scripture collectively today. If you're feeling able, please rise for the reading of God's word. Our passage today is from chapter 9 in John, verses 24 to 33. So a second time, they summoned the man who had been blind and told him, Give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. He answered, whether or not he's a sinner, I don't know. One thing I do know, I was blind, and now I can see. Then they asked him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? I already told you, he said, and you didn't listen. Why do you want to hear it again? You don't want to become his disciples too, do you? 
They ridiculed him. You're that man's disciple, but we're Moses' disciples. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but this man, we don't know where he's from. This is an amazing thing, the man told them. You don't know where he is from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God doesn't listen to sinners, but if anyone is God-fearing and does his will, he listens to them. Throughout history, no one has ever heard of someone opening the eyes of a person born blind. If this man were not from God, he wouldn't be able to do anything. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Erica. You guys may be seated. Well, this morning we are wrapping up our series, This Is My Testimony, that we've been in the last few weeks. And uh, this morning we're going to hear from one of our advisors. Uh, over the last couple of weeks we've heard from a couple of our staff members, Erica Watson, our executive director, and Alex, our worship leader. Um, but John, who I'm going to introduce you to in just a minute, uh, is one of our advisors. And our advisors are, are a group of people who we see eventually being elders. It's a board that we put together kind of in our first year that we eventually would move towards being elders, which is a process we are in. Um, and John is one of those, as well as Maria Tackett and Stephen Pappas. Uh, so I wanted to kind of, if any of you weren't aware of that board, share that with you. Throughout this series on our testimonies, we've intended a couple of things through this series. One, we wanted this to be a series that was culture shaping, meaning that it's a series that was shaping us as a people who are accustomed to sharing the story of what God has done in our lives. Uh, whether that is big or small, whether it feels big or small, people who are accustomed to doing that kind of work, uh, and for it to be a series casting vision for what it looks like to do this. I think many of us maybe come to this with certain uh, ideas of what sharing our testimony looks like, what it means to share your faith, what it means to share the story of what God has done in your life. Uh, that can be quite intimidating, and so we wanted to, to cast some vision for what it looks like to do this simply by focusing on the sharing of our stories. And with Easter coming up next week, wanting to encourage you to invite someone to join us for an Easter service. Maybe it's someone who you need to share your story with, or maybe that God's put on your heart to share your story with. But at the very least, to begin that process by inviting them to join us on a Sunday morning. This morning, though, I want to introduce you to John. John Peterson and his wife, Cindy, have been with us for the last four years or so. Uh, and their daughter and son-in-law, uh, Ashley and Kellen Dickens, have been with us since the very beginning. So they were part of our launch team. Uh, I always love to point out at that point they had zero kids. Now they have three. <laughs> Um, but they've been a part of our team for the last four years. John and Cindy lead a small group for us. Um, <clears throat> John has been working with the organization crew for 40 years now, um, doing both uh, sort of campus ministry here, but also international ministry. They served in Kiev as uh, missionaries for about seven years and then Budapest for four, uh, and so have been doing this kind of work for a long time. Uh, in addition to that, uh, John has been on our advisory team for the last couple of years and just so grateful for the wisdom that he brings. And so wanted to share a little bit of his story with you all this morning. So if you will join me in welcoming John. John, thank you for being with us this morning and being willing to share a little bit of your story with us. I'm wondering if you'd just be willing to start and share a little bit of kind of where your story began, some of the early days. Well, thanks. And <clears throat> yes, it's great to be with you. Good morning. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to share a little of my story with you. Um, uh, you know, early on, I learned that I received approval by performing well and achieving things. And uh, as a kid, you know, in grade school, that wasn't that hard. Um, it got harder. <laughs> uh, a couple of areas where I really strove to both achieve and perform. Uh, school was certainly one of them, but music was another. I played the bassoon. And by the time I'd gotten into high school, uh, there was more kind of going on in my heart than just wanting approval. I was increasingly connecting my value or my worthwhileness to my performing or to achieving things. Uh, if I did well, I felt good about myself. Uh, I felt like I had worth. 
But when I failed, I felt like I had less. Uh, <laughs> so the music part was something that came pretty easily to me. And I developed this goal in high school of wanting to become the best bassoonist in the world uh, for my age. <laughs> Modest goals. Yeah. Modest goals. <laughs> yeah. We could say other things about that, too. But... <laughs> Um, I was studying uh, the bassoon with a bassoonist in the Detroit Symphony, and he arranged for me to do an audition for um, Curtis Institute of Music. It's a music conservatory in Philadelphia. Uh, the professor of bassoon there is the first bassoonist in the Philadelphia Orchestra. So every spring, the Philadelphia Orchestra would come to Ann Arbor and do a concert series. So I was to do this audition, and I showed up at his hotel room. I'm putting my instrument together, getting ready to play, and he's making small talk and uh, asks me things like, you know, what, what do you enjoy doing? And I'm telling him, I love math and chemistry, some other things. And he looks at me and says, do one of those things. D don't be a musician. It's not what you want to hear. No. <laughs> he shared his frustrations with performing, uh, frustrations with teaching. Uh, he had a couple of teenage boys that were having issues. He talked to me about that. And uh, I, I think, you know, the audition went fine. But I left there thinking, he has everything I want but he doesn't have happiness. He's not satisfied. He teaches the best students anywhere at this music conservatory. Uh, the Philadelphia Orchestra is known as a big five. Uh, there are five orchestras in the US that stand above all the rest. The Philadelphia is one of them. I thought 20 years from now, I'm gonna sit where you're sitting. But I left there thinking I could achieve all of my goals and not have the the happiness, the fulfillment that I thought they might bring. Wow. I think the question we're all asking is, do you still play the bassoon? <laughs> you know, uh, 40 years later, it's not like it was 40 years ago. <laughs> John, thank you for sharing that and just kind of the, the ache that you felt both from seeking that validation and, and value in your performance um, as well as kind of the disillusionment of here is someone who has everything that I want and yet they're not content, they're not satisfied. And uh, the thing that strikes me about that story is I think myself included, many of us would have walked away thinking, well, it'll be different for me. When I have all of that, I'll be content. And instead, your reaction was to really take that seriously and say, okay, this guy has everything I want, and yet he's not content. Maybe I need to re-examine some things. And so where did your story go from there? How did you come to hear the story of Jesus and, and those kinds of things? Okay. So I left there, and I made a change right away in my planning. So instead of going to a music conservatory, I would go to the University of Michigan and uh, study music performance, but also study chemical engineering because they go so well together, right? So I was going to hedge my bets. You know, if, if music wouldn't fulfill me, perhaps the chemi would. So I'm in my first year on campus, and one evening, there's a knock at my door. And I open it, and there's Jill. Now, I had met Jill in high school. I also play piano. so. Jill was in the music school. She was a piano performance major. And, uh, but we had competed uh, in piano, uh, different competitions throughout high school. And Jill is this kind and gentle soul. Uh, she was with another guy, and they asked me if I would give them uh, my reaction or my response to a brief outline that talks about how a person could know God personally. And I thought, well, sure, come on in. And they uh, explained to me that God loved me, that he had a wonderful plan for my life, how 
my sin created this, this break or this separation between God and myself, but that Jesus Christ had died on the cross to pay the price or the penalty for my sin so that I could know God and have this relationship, know his love and his plan for my life. But that I needed to respond. I needed to uh, place my trust, my faith in Christ to be my savior. So as I'm hearing all of this, the awkward is feeling more and more, uh, the conversation is feeling more and more awkward to me. Um, I th thought I was a Christian. So I, I, I've, I'd always attended church. It just even as a little kid, my family went to church. But I had never heard this. Uh, I thought that a Christian was somebody who believed that God existed and was trying to live a good life, was trying to be kind to people, trying to do good things. And I thought I more or less qualified. So uh, I I'm telling Jill and her friend, you know, uh, thank you. I I'm already a Christian. And this, is, this is really encouraging. Good night. <laughs> And they, they leave, and it's, it's, it's fine, it's an, but it's, it felt awkward. <laughs> and, uh, but you know, in the next several weeks, I, even though I was trying to push that conversation kind of out of my thinking, I kept thinking more and more about it. And I realized that if I were to die, I would be separated from God, that I didn't know his love and forgiveness. And so one evening, I got on my knees in my dorm room, and I, it was just a simple prayer, but it was something to the effect of, uh, Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for me. Um, would you please come into my life and forgive me of my sin? And would you make me the kind of person you want me to be? And that was about it. And uh, nothing happened. <laughs> you know, I didn't feel differently. I didn't see anything. It, it just, it just, I just prayed. So it was my turn. And I went and I knocked on Jill's door. <laughs> and I came clean with her. I said, well, okay, so no, I wasn't a Christian. But I actually, you know, prayed this prayer yesterday. And so now what? And she opened her Bible, and she showed me how I could know that Christ had come into my life and that he wouldn't leave me, and that it had nothing to do with my performance or with my achievements. And that felt so amazingly free. It, it was fantastic. And so for the first time, you realized kind of this story of Jesus and him dying for you uh, really clicked and made sense for you. Is that right? Tell me, you know, one of the things that you shared with me is that pretty soon after this, this kind of changed the whole trajectory of your life, uh, it kind of sent you in a new direction. Can you tell us kind of why it did that or how it did that? Thanks. Yes. Um, you know, coming into college... I was convinced that success and happiness and fulfillment would come with a successful career, uh, wealth, and a family, and that I was all about setting myself up for those three things. But this relation, this conversation, this relationship with God brought me to realize that it was really very different, that Knowing him, I, I was created for a relationship with him, that uh, bringing glory to him and uh, walking with him, enjoying him, those would be the key pieces of experiencing the fulfillment that I was searching for. Uh, I thought, you know, what... Well, I, I thought about this career path. It, the music... And the chemical engineering just looked smaller to me now than they had before. And I thought about how much I would love to be able to help other people know God the way that I was coming to know him. 
And uh, so I just had made a decision that I wanted to use the best hours of the best days of the best years of my life to help introduce others to their savior and decided that I would go that direction and join the staff of crew. Yeah, you had shared kind of how you felt like all of a sudden those other plans were feeling very small uh, in comparison to a much bigger picture of what God wanted to do with your life. And uh, one of the things that I think, uh, the reason I, I think it's important for us to hear how your life changed so dramatically is I think when it comes to this idea of helping others know Jesus and sharing our story and being a part of that work is we think that that's something we have to be a period, be a Christian for a certain period of time before we do it. And in particular, a very long time <laughs> before we do that work. And to hear that for you, hearing this message and what it meant for you was more of, I want others to know this. I want others to hear this message and to hear this good news and that it sent you in that trajectory with your life. Thinking of Jill and, and the part that she played in your story of her sharing her faith with you and, and how that changed your life, I think for many of us as we think about sharing our faith, we have a lot of fears of, you know, if I share my faith with this person or share my testimony with this person, uh, what are they going to think of me? Or what's that going to do to our friendship? Or uh, are they going to be upset with me? Or is it going to be awkward? Or all of those things. And so I'm wondering... Uh, as you think about the impact that Jill's sharing her faith with you had on you, is there anything that you would say to Jill that would help us to be encouraged in sharing our faith with others? Uh, it's ironic to me that one of the things that can keep me from talking to pe people is uh, fear of hurting the relationship or I, I don't want to bring offense. Jill would not be in my life today if she hadn't taken initiative to talk with me. I mean, I, I can't think of any reason why we would have even stayed connected. We were acquaintances. But, you know, we were trading emails last month. Wow. And I have told Jill over and over again how grateful I am that she put my welfare and my well-being ahead of her comfort that she didn't stay in her dorm room that night, but she took initiative to come and talk with me so that I could be connected to my God, my Savior. I, I learned pretty quickly that talking with others about Christ and doing it well had just a few pieces to it. There was to take the initiative to talk about Christ, uh, doing it in the power of God's spirit, uh, and trusting him to use me or to speak through me and to be at work. But the last piece is my favorite, and that is to then leave the result to God. Mm -hmm. I can't change anybody's life, and it's not my job. Mm -hmm. um, my job is to bring a message. It is to tell other people what I've seen or experienced. Somebody explained to me once that a witness is simply somebody who has seen or experienced something and then tells others. And that's all. And that really freed me up. Um, I uh, learned so much by beginning to talk to folks about my faith. <laughs> uh, I can't tell you the number of times People would ask me a question, and I would be thinking and, and saying, uh, great question, I don't know, but I'll find out, or I'll help you find out. And so going and asking folks who knew more and learning, their questions led me to explore things and to find out things that I had no idea about. And those conversations led me to exercise faith. Uh, uh, you know, like probably most of you, I'm more comfortable keeping my mouth quiet, right? It's easier to say nothing. But I found that when I would say, okay, Lord, would you please give me courage to speak up? Would you speak through me? That he was and is glad to answer that request. 
And so that would increase my, my faith and my connection with him. John, I know uh, one of the most painful parts of you and Cindy's story is the loss of your son, Ian. And I'm wondering if you'd be willing to share a little bit about that and uh, how that affected your faith, uh, but also how this message of Jesus helped you or kind of played into you walking through that journey. Yeah, Ian is our third child. Uh, 11 years ago, he was a senior at NC State. And in October of that year, he was very sick all of a sudden, at least it seemed sudden to us, and diagnosed uh, with lymphoma. And it was very aggressive. And it was a little less than five months later that he died. And that was 11 years ago last month was the uh, anniversary of his death. It is the hardest thing that Cindy and I have had to endure or to walk through. And we think about him daily, constantly. Uh, the hurt doesn't just stop. We've asked hard questions about it, too. Uh, you know, God, being good, how could you let this happen? Why would you let this happen? And there are a couple of things I feel like he's taught me over the course of these years. One is we were never alone. As hard as things are or have been, we never walked it by ourselves. He was with us every step. I think of a passage in Psalm 23 where it says, uh, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for thou art with me. Your rod, your staff, they comfort me. So as awful, uh, as horrible as the valley of the shadow of death is, uh, he's present. He's always present. And, boy, that is such a big piece of how the gospel lands on me. I shared earlier how, as a kid, and, and even through high school, I wanted to gain acceptance or approval from people who were important to me, but I saw my value as connected to what I did, and I felt increasingly alone and isolated. It's like I realized that my parents couldn't live my life for me. It was all on me, for good or bad. And I felt really alone in that. And the reality was, I was alone, spiritually. But with Christ coming into my life, I am no longer alone. There will never be a time when I look over my shoulder and think, where did he go? He will always be present. And it's interesting how, as a kid, I don't know that I often felt or could have said I feel alone, and yet I really was. <laughs> and today there can be times where I really feel alone, but I'm not. Mm. The reality is he is present. Yeah. And that's because Christ died in my place and allowed me to have relationship with God through taking away my sin. I have relationship with him. It's precious to me. John, thank you for, for sharing that. Um, I think it's, it's, it's really powerful for us to hear from you that you sharing your faith uh, and sharing your testimony is not something that you do because life has just been easy for you and that there's never been challenges or questions about God, but that, in fact, through some of the hardest things... It actually um, has complicated that story with God, but also gives more to speak to of how you've encountered God, even in those difficult seasons. And I think that's important for us to hear, uh, 
as others who have experienced hard things and wonder where God is in that. Um, when it comes to us sharing our testimonies, I think one of the things that many of us wrestle with is kind of the feeling of, is it going to make a difference? You know, is anyone going to believe this anyway? And so as we kind of bring this to a close, I'm wondering what hope you might give us around why it makes a difference, why it matters. Uh, I, I find again and again, I am just surprised to learn that there is so much going on behind the facade that I see in the person in front of me. Um, but I shouldn't be. <laughs> I, I've learned that God is constantly at work around me and in people in me. And I shouldn't be surprised to find out that they're thinking things and asking questions and wondering about things that on the surface, I, there's no indication. Scripture kind of sets us up to have an expectation that some people aren't interested. Some people will want to think more about it. And some people are ready to move toward God and, uh, and faith in Christ right now. Mm-hmm. And there's no way to know mm-hmm. where that person is. Um, I've seen over and over again, even conversations that, to my mind, don't really go anywhere, uh, to f- approach folks with kindness, gentleness, and respect, Uh, And to talk about Jesus, uh, people appreciate it. Uh, I struggle to think of times when folks were offended by me um, initiating a conversation. They may not have enjoyed parts of it, but I think they felt like it was a good conversation. I think. (laughs) You know, I, I, I love that idea of God being at work in people's lives without us really being aware of it and... Uh, this is kind of a tangent, but I think when I think of the the chosen series, one of the things that they did so well is depict the way that God was working in people's lives and maybe the desperation that they were feeling and the way that when Jesus stepped into their life, it it it, it there's nothing else that could have spoken to or addressed that desperation like Jesus and just knowing that that. Even if we can't see it, we don't know it, uh, many people in our lives are experiencing that and uh, that Jesus is the one that can provide that life that they're so desperate for. And so, John, thank you so much for being with us this morning. Can we give John a hand for being a part of this? As we kind of draw this to a close and we're, we're coming up on Easter, uh, I'm wondering for you... Um, you know, is there someone that God has put on your heart to share your story with? Um, I think it's important for you to know that sharing your story doesn't mean necessarily sharing everything that there is to share. That it can begin with simply sharing a little bit of your story. It doesn't need to be a big, scary, intimidating thing, but begins with just some meaningful conversation But what I want us to think through this morning is that when it comes to this idea of testimony, um, what we're talking about is simply pointing to the story of what God has done in our lives. That it's not about having all of the answers worked out. And that's what I love about the story that we read in Scripture uh, this morning with this man who was born blind and how they came to him with all of these questions And his answer was, I don't know. All I know is that I was blind and now I see. That's what we're being invited to in this, is simply to share the story of what we have experienced. And one of the reasons we come together in worship is that worship is a place where we are reminded of what God has done. Done in our lives individually, in the church, corporately, and in the world more generally. So I want to invite you to just bow your heads for a moment, close your eyes, and I want, to, I want you to reflect on this question. What is the story of what God has done in your life? However big or small it may feel. 
What is the story of what God has done? Maybe for some of you, the question is not what has God done, but the, the feeling that God hasn't done anything in your story. But you're asking God, why haven't you shown up in my story? I want to invite you to bring that to him in this moment. Maybe you're thinking, God, here I am. I'm, I, I'm blind. I want to see. Why haven't you shown up? Maybe for others of you, it's that you can name that story, but need the courage to be able to share that story. I want to invite you to just ask God for that courage now. Because there may be someone who could be incredibly encouraged by hearing your story. I want to give you some time to just bring this to God. We're going to have our prayer team available if you would like someone to pray one of these things over you. But just take some moments now and pray. Bring these to God's presence as we prepare for communion together.